Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Let me, uh, I know I'll scare you half to death, but this shouldn't be a too awful long of a sermon. So don't keep doing this during three. We'll, we'll try to make it happen. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, isn't that a wonderful word? The disciples were multiplying. There arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenistics because of the widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, uh, Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. There is that term again. The number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Let's pray. Now, Father, we thank you for the time that we can come together. It's your word. And Lord, if you were speaking as if we were in your presence, I pray that you will speak in the same way today, that we will listen to the word of God, that we will seek the, to know that it is your best for us. Father, your truth, your glory, and your way. Jesus, you said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we know that that comes to us. And we can see that way in truth and life in Scripture. So I pray today that you would give us hearts to be able to see, understand, know, hearts willing to accept, and Lord, that to be blessed by the way in which you do things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Exciting days in the book of Acts. We've seen thousands saved. They've been going through uh, great times. Uh, Though the disciples have been told not to preach, they could not help it. They went everywhere that they went. They went preaching the name of Jesus, telling people about the resurrection of Christ. All these wonderful things were happening. Exciting times. People were getting saved daily. But everything was not always easy. There will always be issues and there will always be obstacles all along the way. I, I wish I could change one little part of Scripture, but Scripture tells us that it is impossible that offenses do not come. As long as we're in this world, there will be things that kind of rub us the wrong way. There will be things that we're not going to agree with. There are going to be things that we're going to like. We will be offended. That's just the way that it was. Nobody meant it to happen. It just happened. And truly, I think what we see in Acts chapter 6 is nothing more but nothing less than good old-fashioned growing pains. There will be pains when we are growing. Really, the term that we should understand in Scripture, it's an organic type growth. Remember that Jesus said, unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it does, something amazing happened. The word that we would understand is literally organic. That seed will die, life will come forward, and at that point, it will start pushing its way through the dirt. It's buried in the dirt, but it will start pushing its way through so that it could spring forth, and, and the very essence of that seed will come forth in what will be a plant or a tree or a bush or whatever it may be, but it will come forward in life. It may just begin as a little sprig after it pushes its way through the dirt. It may grow to be this huge tree or whatever it may be, or this beautiful flowering bush or flower. But it's all the essence of what was in that seed manifesting itself. It's always going to be hard. There's always going to be this pushing forward. It's always going forward towards maturity. Never resting, always reaching the warmth of the sun, and it comes forward 
to follow the boundaries that God created for it. Now, the disciples here in uh, Acts 6 found themselves, the apostles there, they found themselves at, at center stage. There's this huge preaching ministry that's going on, but there are certain responsibilities that are coming on too. There's certain oversight that has been thrust upon them. Matter of fact, we could go back to the end of chapter 4 when it said that they were there in one heart and one accord. But, but people begin to see the need of all these disciples that were there, and they begin to say, we need to be a part of this. And they started selling land and bringing the proceeds and laying them at the apostles' feet. Nobody told them to do that. So these people felt the, the desire to do that, and they did. And nobody told them, he said, we got all this money we would like to give for this common effort. Nobody said, well, I guess you need to go to Peter. It was just a, a normal way that they decided to do it. So they began to, to bring it to the apostles' feet, and they began to distribute to the needs of the people. And part of the problem here is, as we see in chapter 6, that, that there became a, a, a growing pain, an issue it says here that there arose a complaint against the, the Hebrew-speaking widows by the Greek-speaking, the Greek custom, that's how they were raised, by their widows. It seems that, that there was a, a, a neglect, is the word that it uses there, in the daily distribution. It, it looked as if that there was a preference given to the Hebrew-speaking widows over the others. Now, they probably didn't think about it. Probably didn't mean to. It was just something that can... Y'all know what I mean when I said it just falls through the cracks. And sometimes when you see that something is falling through the crack, you, you try to, to, to change it. You try, and, and by the way, in our lives, there will always be change. There's always going to be hard things. And, and, and the wisest thing to do is, is face the truth and deal with it correctly. Deal with it wisely. So they, they didn't really mean to. But, but what came off, though they didn't mean it to, it looked like hypocrisy. God loves the world. The blood of Jesus Christ is for everyone. Y'all know what I mean when I say this? It's level at the foot of the cross. Rich or poor, old or young, right? Educated, uneducated. I mean, the people who, who grew up in good homes or people who grew up in broken homes, it really doesn't matter. God loves everyone the same. Amen? But yet, it may have looked differently because in, in the mass of all these people, and trying to take care of the needs of all these people, and, and the disciples were falling short in it. And, and they didn't mean anything by it, but it looked bad. And, and Peter, when, it, when, when this criticism came to him, he, he said, you know, this is not right. Let's do the right thing. So in verse 2, it says, the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. This is a need, but we've got something that we need to do too. James, the half-brother of Jesus, said this. James 1 verse 27 says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, to keep oneself unspotted from the world. If they're in trouble, if they're in need, make sure that you're doing the right thing by taking care of of those. Now, you may not be able to do everything for them, but if they're in trouble, if they're in need, do what you can to take care of that. So he said, we need to deal with this. And their desire was to, to, to come together and model something of service. <coughs> Jesus modeled it for them, and they were trying to follow in that same model. You remember John 13, Jesus met with the disciples. He gets up from the table and he goes over there and gets a wash pot and goes around the king of kings, 
the God who sits on the throne of glory, got down on his hands and knees and began to wash dirty, stinking feet. Now you may say your feet don't stink. If you're walking down dusty streets every day and you got sandals on, y'all hear me? Now you might like the smell of your feet better than the smell of other people's feet, but what was modeled before them was that he got down and washed all their feet. By the way, when the 5,000 men as well as women and children were there and Jesus took the bread and broke it and, 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 and the fish and broke it and, and the disciples had baskets, he gave it to them and they went and served the people. They had seen service modeled before them by Christ himself. And Christ had actually brought them in and said, we want you to follow this. We want you to serve as well. And they didn't feel like it was a responsibility. Don't you know that they felt like it was a privilege? I mean, I've often thought about this. Could you imagine watching Jesus break it, filling up your basket and going out and watching, being able to give to the people a nice, wonderful lunch that satisfied everyone there. And when your basket was empty, you just got in row again. I mean, I'd be up there going, whoo, this is cool. Man, this is fun. I can't, it was a miracle. And they were living out a miracle. It had been modeled for them, and they saw that what they were supposed to do was love others, but the disciples had done too much. Y'all listen to me. Every one of us have a unique calling from God. You, uh, I, I buy a coat. You know when I, I buy it off the rack. Y'all know what I'm talking about? When I go there, it's going to be a whole bunch of them there, and I just try to get one to fit. Sometimes the arms are too long. Sometimes my waist is too big. This one actually used to fit. Y'all pray for your pastor. And by the way, I don't like this new fashion where everybody's wearing these tight things. And I, don't, I just do it like this, right? I, I bought this off the rack. But you can go and have one custom made that will fit you. Now listen to me. God didn't just make you off the rack. There's not a thousand more like you. Uh, we know the fingerprints are different. How many of y'all have ever seen a, a, a fingerprint printed out? How many of them look the same? I look at one fingerprint and I look at the other and I'm like, yeah, they look the same to me. But people who know what they're doing can look at that and say there's never one that's ever been the same. We all have been custom made. We have been made in the image of God. We don't look alike. We don't talk alike. Some of your feet stink more than others. But you were uniquely created. Come on now. For the glory of God alone. Nobody else can bring to God what you can bring. Nobody else can take your place. Nobody else is like you in any way, shape, form, or fashion. You are uniquely created. You are uniquely crafted. You are uniquely called. You have been uniquely gifted for a kingdom purpose. And your assignment is to be carried out by you, listen, in love. He wants to hear your love. Your love is not off the rack either. It's unique to you. Your experiences, where you've been, what you've gone through, all of those things are unique to you. And you never should settle for anything else of bringing your all to God. But there are too many people who would rather settle for a career than a life of love for God. We all have a role. Now, real quickly, 
I want to talk to you about the church because this is really a microcosm of what's happening here. There is going to be the creation here of another ordained, a church ordained, a church separated role of service for the people. But it's also there by, by, by those others that are serving a role as well. Keep your finger in Acts 6. I'm going to go to you real quickly, very quickly in, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And I want you to hear what Paul is sharing to the church at Ephesus of how there should be other responsibilities taken care of too. He says there, And he that is Christ, God himself gave some to be apostles, gave, it's a God gift. He gave some to be prophets. He gave some to be evangelists. He gave some to be pastors. He gave some to be teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints. These roles, these God-given people were to help the saints to be equipped to do what God wants them to do. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. He, their, their role is to help the saints become able to do, equipped to do the work of the ministry of Christ on the earth. But it says, for the building up of, for the edifying of the body that is the church of Christ. So he gives certain leaders who have certain uh, God-called gifts to help church members to grow to do the ministry so that the body of Christ can become mature. He goes on to say, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of God, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men. And there are wolves out there in sheep's clothing. In the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, that is Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. There will be those, and we have them in our church, ordained leaders to, to, to help follow what God's called them to do. And we're also going to find out that there is this new branch that we, God will bring in, that they would have a ordained, set aside uniquely gifted role to serve the people in love. Now, let me go over the top ones real quick with you. There's just three quick words I wanted to show with you that talk about this first leadership position. The first one is in 1 Timothy 3 as well as in other places. It's a term that we define it as bishops. Bishops in the church. Now, you may be saying, we don't have bishops in the Baptist church. Y'all look up here. We have bishops in the Word of God. Right? Ephesians 4, he gave us different things there to do. The bishop's role, uh, by the word, by the way, the, 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 the word in the Greek, I want you to know that these don't blend together. There's a unique word for them, is episcopus. And it's, it's called an overseer, one who gives oversight. The second term is in Titus. It's in uh, chapter 1, verse 7. It's called elder, an elder. And, and that's the word Presbyteros. There is a presbytery, the Presbyterian church. You know, that's, that's where it comes from. And that means those who preside over. Now, I think this is unique and I think it's perfect. In the New Testament, the word elder in singular form is four times. But in the plural form, it's 60 times. That tells me that there was a, when it speaks of elders, it's speaking of a group of elders. Okay? Now, every church is going to have a pastor. But you may have staff positions that can be called pastor as well. They kind of fulfill a, the same role, right? And then there are, will be those that will be elders and that they have a, a responsibility. They, now, I, I kind of thought this was unique. I started pastoring full-time when I was 25 years old. I mean, I was as green as green could be. And, and I did not have everything figured out. As a matter of fact, I had more that I didn't know than I did know. But I was an elder, not by age, but the church had set me aside because of a spiritual maturity. 
It didn't mean I knew everything, but I was trying with all my heart to learn. By the way, I'm still 60 and I don't know everything. I, I, I'm still just trying to figure things out as I go along the way. Nobody's there yet. I know some people feel like that. They, that, that what they think about things they should overrule everybody else's. How many of y'all like your own opinion? Don't you think that we'd have no arguments ever, if everybody else would just change their ideas and agree with your opinion? Don't hold your breath. All right. So elders. Then there's the third term that is called shepherd, 1 Peter Chapter 5, verse 2, it, 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 it is the word poimen, where we really get our, our term pastor from. Jesus is the chief shepherd. We are under shepherds. And that means to tend a flock. In Jesus' day, they saw sheep on hillsides all over. And there would be a, a, a shepherd there. But the sheep, it was their responsibility to follow the shepherd. He wasn't supposed to be out there pushing them all the time. Matter of fact, Jesus said the sheep will know the shepherd's voice and will trust the shepherd and love the shepherd and follow him. That's what they were to do. And when the sheep were in need, he would take care of those things too. It was to lead, to love, to care for. Sheep will wander if you're not careful. So provide for them, literally provide for the soul of the people. Now, this is something that's not talked about very much, but a shepherd can only tend a small flock. And there's a difference between a shepherd and a rancher. A shepherd can only take care of a small group, but a rancher can have many shepherds underneath them, and if you have the proper amount of shepherds underneath them, it really doesn't matter how much sheep you have. Whether it's 50 or 50,000. If you've got enough to do that, every sheep can be individually taken care of. I think I, you understand why I thought it important to share those responsibilities that we have in the church. Because we go back to chapter 6 and we see here that, that great things are happening there, but, but without them meaning to, something was neglected. So it says in verse 3, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you, term there, from among you. When, when y'all found me, I wasn't here. All right? As pastor, you, you put together a search committee. I call them a hunting party. And, and they go out with the, with the leadership of God, and they find somebody, and y'all look me over. Right? I always tell them, it's all right. Y'all look me over because I'm looking you over. Right? I remember when I stood right here, and I wasn't too sure if I was supposed to be your pastor or not. I, I, I really, even at that moment, you think he'd pull the trigger. I'm like, Lord, I only want your will for my life. And even the day that you called me as your pastor, uh, some of y'all may remember, but I didn't even say yes. And brought us Duncan, helped me there. He is an elder. Whether we don't, we don't call him that in our church. I don't have a problem with elders, by the way. I, I like the wisdom of many counselors. I, I like, and I try my best in my own leadership to be under authority so that I can have authority. Matthew 8, Jesus was very plain there. He said, if you're not under authority, you can't have authority. But if you have authority, you need to make sure that you're under authority. And I don't mean just the authority of Jesus. We all need to be under the authority of Jesus. But, but this whole thing about the pastors, the, you know, the, the he bull of the woods and all that kind of stuff, there's a word for that. It's called nonsense. It's called foolishness. I'm just like you. I have a calling on my life that I have to fulfill just like you do. And I have giftedness in my life that I need to fulfill just like you do. But we need to come to an understand that in this particular group, God is going to call from among us people who are going to fulfill this need. So he said, seek out men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, amen, and wisdom. I don't care what their intellect is. I want to know if they have a God-given wisdom. 
whom we may appoint over this business. It's where business in the New King James has, has wrecked so many people's life. They say, oh, the deacons are supposed to be over the business. And they have a business model like we have today uh, when we think of business. The word means over this task, over this duty. We're either going to follow the word of God or not. Too many churches are hurt because there's a board of deacons. By the way, we don't have a board of deacons here. We have a fellowship of deacons. And I'll be just very plain with you. I'm not sure that I've ever seen a group of deacons who submit to each other as much as this group does. They have a heart for God. They give me great respect. They listen to me. And I do my dead level best to listen to them. I'm not over them. And they're not over me. I'm not over you, and you're not over me. Can y'all hear me when I say one heart, one accord? Just all of us doing what we're supposed to do. All of us with spiritual maturity listening, listening. All of us seeking God's perfect will. He's the only one that's right all the time. So he said, find some people. People who are already doing it, already serving. They've got a good reputation. People who, who aren't talking about how much they know and how much they think, but people who are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. That means filled to capacity, not partially filled and partially tied to the world. He said, find these people and put them over this responsibility. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer, and to the ministry of the Word. We'll do what we're called to do. Now, the pastor is not to be chief pastor and chief deacon and chief servant. And by the way, y'all look up here. I'm not perfect. If you need me, I'll do it. I will move everything I can to be there for you. But I can't be in every place at all times. I am a shepherd, but whether you pastor a church of 50 people or 5,000, you have one responsibility that's pastor. And if there is a need in the hospital, I'm going to do my best to be there. If there's a need anywhere, I'm going to do my best to be there. Kirby and Sheila left after Sunday school. They had to go pick up Morgan at West Hall. When Kirby called me and said, can you come? My dad's not doing well. Can you come talk to him about his soul? I dropped everything and I went there. I was told that he wouldn't listen to anybody else. It was the right time. It was the right day. His eyes were wide open. Perfectly blue. I shared Christ. He accepted Christ. Tears came rolling down his face. The family said, he don't cry. And I said, well, look right there. I'll do whatever I can to anybody, everybody that I can. If you're looking for me to be that personal with you, I apologize to you right now. There will be times I'm going to drop the ball. There are going to be times I can't do everything at one time. Now, I think most of y'all understand that. I'm going to give y'all another secret, too. I wish that I had a phone. How many of y'all remember Batman? Y'all remember the Bat phone? You can pick it up and had a direct line. I can pray and I can listen and I can study and I can walk and meditate and I can be quiet before the Lord. But let me tell you what God does. I may be in hour six of studying and God will say something in a matter of seconds. And at that point in time, I better write it down because the worst ink is better than my mind. And I'll, I can't write fast enough. And God will just amazingly speak. By the way, He does that in your life too. You'll be driving down the road and the word will, the, the, God will give you a word. And, and you can't, it's not like a faucet. You can just turn that on and turn it off. He comes when he wants, how he wants, to speak what he wants, and you need to be there open for it. 
If I'm not listening during the week, I don't have anything to share with you on Sunday. And I preach this passage so many times, but that doesn't give me a right to not be holy, just absolutely naked before God, to let Him speak transparent. That's the way it works. Well, if we will give ourselves continually to God, God will give Himself continually to us. So, verse 5, this pleased them, and they chose them. By goodness, they chose them. We're going to talk about this man by the name of Stephen in two weeks. Wow. What a man of God. And they, caught, they brought them forward and they, they prayed over them. They laid hands on them. Brother Jim Mills, you've been a deacon for a long time. You've probably been in many, many services. I've been in the ordination of deacon services. And I remember coming before it and laying hands on them to pray blessings on them to pray strength, to pray courage, to pray endless energy. I usually say, Lord, you, you, you call kings. You call prophets. You anointed people in amazing ways. You're the God who does that. I pray that you'll do the same thing. May your hands and blessing, and power, and by the belief of that prayer, and by the trust of that, and knowing that God can do what only He can do, I want to set that person aside for the ministry of Christ alone. And the deacons were born in the church. The word deacon literally means servant. That's all it means. Diaconus. It means servant. And how blessed the church is to have people who will come alongside and not want to be at the front of the line, but we want to be at the back of the line. Not wanting to have somebody sing praise to them, but are willing to pick up a, a water bucket and, and wash feet. Somebody whose main goal in life is to put a smile on God's face. And we're supposed to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But we're also supposed to love each other. And they divide up. And they serve. It pleased the people. If y'all ever want to see a biblical model, look in Exodus chapter 18. I don't have time to talk about it. But Moses' father-in-law had some advice for him. For him. And I, I only had my father-in-law for seven months. I wished I had him longer. He went to be with the Lord two weeks before we were married. But he was a wise man who had been through so much. He had lost both of his legs. He had, he had an injury from Korea that... Um, that set up uh, arthritis in his body, and he he was just like he just wrinkled up, pulled together, had to have a little wheelchair. But he was a great man of God who was so active in all of his life. He was a diver in the Navy. He was just so active all of his life, Lynn's, Lynn's dad. But but I'm telling you, in the position that he was in, where he had to have other people feed him and other, he was so humble. And so thankful, there was so much wisdom, there was so much courage, there was so much boldness, there was so much love. I wish I had more time with him so that I could learn from them. None of us are there yet, but we're, on a, we're, we're pointed hopefully in the right direction. We will be judged by the motivation of our hearts. And what a blessing it is when people come to serve. So let me just say these words very, real quickly. Everybody's called to serve. And everybody should serve based on their giftedness. I think one of the things that Baptists do badly is they're trying to fill out a list of people to put on a committee and they're trying to put a square peg in a round hole. And those people are miserable in Jesus' name. But if you find where you're gifted and serve there, You'll be the happiest people in the world. Serve the Lord with gladness. It's a privilege. It's an honor. And serve to be seen by heaven, not by others. I think one of the greatest pictures is a word in the New Testament that could be understood as under rowers. In the boats in that day, the big boats in that day, there would be the, the oars that would go out from below deck. 
And those people would push those things. Nobody else saw them. So many people want to be the captain up there. Be very careful what you ask for. But that boat would never go unless there were some people who were willing to serve underneath, doing the work that nobody else sees except heaven. By the way, he's the one that will reward. And service will complete you. Service will complete you. A person came to me one time and they, they were just, well, they were depressed. And they, everything in their life was falling apart and they were just down. So I have all this wisdom, right? I said, you know what you need to do as a lady? Go bake a cake. She could cook. She could make cakes like Mickey over there. And I love Mickey's cakes. Bless you. I didn't know what I was getting into when Mickey brought me a cake. But I tell you what, I have a great respect for her now. Praise God. I say, go home and make a cake and take it to somebody and just love them in Jesus' name. You know what she did? She grumbled. I come to the pastor, I expect him to pray over me, which I did. You tell me to make a cake? So she went home and she probably beat them eggs by her hand. You know what I'm talking about? She made a cake and took it to somebody. And when they opened the door, <laughs> Heaven came down and glory filled that person's soul that she was taking a cake for. And she didn't realize that a simple cake would bless somebody else. And she gave that cake in Jesus' name. And guess who got the biggest blessing? Oh, the one who got the cake was so grateful that somebody loved them, that somebody thought of them, that somebody cared. But I think that that person's whole outlook changed because she wasn't thinking about her problems. She was serving somebody else and she got the blessing of it. There is so much that goes on in the world. There's so much that gets in our life and it's like a noose. It, it, when life goes on, it almost gets, almost gets tighter and tighter around our neck to where we can't even breathe. But let me what, tell you what service will do. It will turn you loose and set you free. Because what you do in serving another, God will come forward hundredfold. And you're happy in Jesus. Serve will complete you. Now I'm not telling you all you men to bake a cake. <laughs> You don't want the pastor to bake you a cake. I'll give you a parking thing at the hospital where you can go to the emergency room and get in quick. But we all have giftedness. How blessed it would be if the church just come back and serve. You know what makes a good deacon? Modeling service. They don't just go meet in the back room. Our chairman, and I'm going to say this in hush, Broadus Duncan's our chairman. Every month he's going to come in there and he's going to give them a piece of paper to all the other deacons. I'm not supposed to talk about what happens in deacons meeting. What happens in deacons meeting stays in deacons meeting. But let me, let me just tell you, he'll give them a piece of paper and all those deacons will write down how many calls they've made, how many people that they've seen, how many people they've checked in on. You know what he does? He's holding them accountable. Don't tell me you're doing something. Show me you're doing something. He looked at me the first time and says, I think we should do this. And I said, amen. Amen. You know what he does? He models it. Have you ever walked into a cold church? You ever walked into a hot church? The atmosphere is different. Amen? 
And it's not the pastor. Lord knows. There's something among the people. There's a love that just flows. I used to not know what this meant, but they say from breast to breast. Y'all ever heard that phrase? There's something that's special. So Sarah, I love you. You are a loving soul. Deborah Palmer, I nicknamed her Dynamite. Comes in small packages. I'm telling you, if she finds a need, she's the first one to call. She wants to meet needs. Steve Thomas, thank you for being my friend. Thank you for coming to check on me and serving me, your pastor, and calling and loving on me. Thank you for the daily prayers. There's some things I went through last year that nobody in this church knows about, but Steve knew about them. He prayed for me and loved me. Let the church be the church. Let the people rejoice. For we've settled the question and we've made our choice. Let the anthems ring out. Songs of victory swell. For the church triumphant is alive and well. Let love be the center of everything that we do.